Well, I guess we can get underway. So, here is not coming. <coughs> Vacation, I should say. <laughs> We're very good with them. Those waste district folks. Yeah. Get all the perks. Yeah. Is everyone good with the uh, two batch two minutes? Oh, there's two minutes, right? Two minutes to approve. <coughs> something you want to comment on? I'm here representing Aging in Heartland, okay. and I might have a question regarding budget. Okay. Thumbs up for that. Okay. For the tax rate, I should say. Okay, then we can move right on to talk about the tax sale. Uh, you know? No, I don't think it could have gone any better. We started the day with seven properties going to tax sale. Uh, one settled 10 minutes before the tax sale, leaving us with six. There was a couple problem um, properties or potential for, you know, some, you know, us and having to handle certain things. Um, one was an unlanded mobile home on somebody's property. Um, it's in close proximity to their house. It had been rented out as kind of a rental property to a woman who had died and so left it to a daughter and the daughter did not go to probate and so it was kind of in a limbo. Um, the daughter left the residence, was no longer living there, so this residence was on this parcel. Um, it went up to tax sale, the person that owns the land ended up getting it, so that worked out pretty well. Um, so that is, uh, without it going through probate, very difficult to get a title, so this person will get um, such a title to the land and be able to um, move on and do what he would like to do with it. The other one was a small okay. point, two make acres. A, make a comment on that one. Um, I thought um, the lawyer who was representing the town, Kevin O'Toole, did a, a, a very uh, lovely thing uh, in that he eliminated his fee for that particular client in order to move it because the client was, or the customer was hedging. So just wanted to throw that in. Um, also a point two parcel, uh, two point, point two acre parcel on my utility on Quay Hill Road that was kind of, you know, no man's land, kind of a steep slope area. Uh, and a person on land surrounding it and he picked that up and kind of made their parcel a whole. Um, so it worked well for him and it worked well for us. Um, the rest of the parcel sold, interestingly enough, um, the parcel on the corner of Route 12 and Mace Hill, which was the subject of a letter last meeting, um, about it kind of falling, pieces falling into the river and the stream bank and all that good stuff, um, did go to tax sale, somebody bid on it. Of course, the owner has a year to <coughs> claim it. Um, but if not, it will go to the new owner and perhaps something better will become of it. So um, that did move along as well. Um, we ended up with technically one parcel. Um, there was a person with a mobile home uh, trailer that uh, had not paid, uh, had paid delinquent taxes, but there was penalties um, left to be paid. The person did not pay the penalties, went up for tax sale. Um, with the $400 owned on it, and they will, in order to claim the house back, will still own the town $400, but if they don't pay the $400, it's ours in a year. Um, and they need to pay 
interest on it as well. Um, there is a mortgage on it, so we're looking for that to kind of settle up uh, before it gets to the end of the year. Um, so that was kind of a one hiccup, but certainly could have been a little bit more interesting for the town than it ended up being. Um, all in all, I would say it went as well as it could have gone. Again, these last 12, you know, we started with 10 and 20, we were down to 12. Um, you know, those last 12 were just, you know, just difficult to, to resolve, and um, looks like we did. Uh, we we're down to under, just under $130,000 in delinquent taxes, and that's not including the revenue from the tax sale. So it's at least another 17. So we're making pretty good headway um, in that direction. Would we, when do you perceive the next round? You know, do we wait a year or? I think waiting a year with this batch is probably gonna be, is what we're gonna need to do. Mm -hmm. um, we still have another 40 delinquent people, um, but a lot of those are mobile home. Uh, or unlanded mobile homes, which is difficult. Hmm. Uh, I did talk to Kevin a little bit about that, and um, you know we may need to deal with you know a couple people that deal with used mobile homes or something to that effect. Hmm. Um, I don't know what else to do. Yeah. Um, again, I've been kind of preaching this you know the last couple months. Um, the unlanded mobile homes is a real difficult problem for us in this town. And um, as we move forward with this batch here, and we're talking, you know, the problem is it's not a lot of money. You know, it's maybe $500 in taxes, but, you know, three or four years out and, you know, kind of abusing the system. So um, dealing with unlanded mobile homes, which is a mobile home on somebody else's property, which has been given permission to essentially have a mobile home there, is just difficult because, you know, there's nothing, there's no land to it. So you either find a buyer that's interested in a mobile home or, you know, we're, we've just, we're taking ownership of it and then we're a glorified mobile home dealership, mm -hmm. you know, type thing. So, um, again, most towns, you know, they have the ability to do that. You have to subdivide property in order to, you know, have two separate dwellings on it. Very much. How many unlanded mobile homes do we have? I don't have that answer. <clears throat> well, the, a trailer park is considered unlanded, correct? Um, in this case, we're not considering yeah. a mobile, we're not, like Dale's, we wouldn't consider, I mean, we're talking, you know, an instance where, you know, there's an interesting thing that we've got going on, two brothers on Webster Road, Once a, this is an actual case of it being even kind of a nicer situation, but still is problematic, where the guy has a, such a log cabin, doesn't own any of the land, um, both are delinquent, um, you know, but, you know, you know, he was, he, he came to an agreement um, on the log cabin that's on his brother's land, um, you know, ultimately, but it, you know, he was originally slated for tax sale. Um, you know, what do you do with that? So this is an unlanded log cabin? It's an unlanded log cabin, um, you know, and, um, you know, then he gets talking about, you know, how he wants to sell it or this, that, and everything else, but, you know, the brother's there, and you kind of ask the brother, well, you know, how do you feel about that? All of a sudden, you know, somebody new and exciting, no relationship to you, owning a house, and no property on your land, and, you know, it gets complicated quick, you know, people, yeah. it's kind of a, it's kind of, um, it's kind of a type of low-income housing, um, but, however, as time <coughs> progresses and, families move on or, you know, change his hands. Um, in this case, the guy on Route 5 moved into the house. The lady was already living there. Um, it was a rental agreement. He seemed fine when he bought the property. So that was an okay arrangement up until she died. And then she essentially, the daughter was essentially squatting in the house, not paying rent. It was an issue, not paying taxes, and couldn't get rid of her until she finally just kind of up and left. So that's a real problem here. So 
Um, I don't know the number. I'd have to, you know, I don't know if Doug's computer can kind of separate that out, but um, there's, there's enough. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I know when um, the state gives the property tax information that there is something that's coming from the listers to the state because uh, there, there is a lot of confusion um, during tax preparation time for some of Heartland residents um, and, their, and their tax bills. So it's not necessarily what we're doing, but it's what the state's doing. In this case, you know, that's, uh, that's the next, you know, step of the tax sale. I mean, there's still a couple of heavy hitters that if they don't, you know, do what they need to do, will probably be up to tax sale, and those are kind of easy, or easier to mm -hmm. see sell. Um, but again, we got 40 people left, and, you know, I would say a good percentage of those are mobile homes or some sort of an unlanded mobile home. experience with other towns do with this issue of unlanded? I mean, obviously White River's got plenty of mobile home parks. And uh, again, it generally in the zoning bylaws, you can't, you can't have, you know, a second structure. I mean, you have a barn, but you can't have a second residential structure on your property without a, without a subdividing plan. Okay. So you wouldn't be able to have, you know, another family living you know, you know, in order to make that happen, you'd have to subdivide the parcel. And the person would own that parcel and then, you know, would need to satisfy uh, wastewater criteria and such things as that. And, yeah. it's, you know, if, then there's no question as to, you know, who, you know, doing what and who's responsible for what. Um, in this particular case, <laughs> interestingly enough, the mobile home that we ended up with, uh, you know, the, the person in the unweighted mobile home that we ended up with said, oh no, you know, I shouldn't be getting taxed on this anyway, so you gotta go get the money from my parents. The parents who were also delinquent came in to pay and they were like, oh yeah, no, no way in heck are we paying that. So, you know, um, you know, if you, you don't get into that problem, it's clear cut as to what's going on. Okay. Thank you. The second best thing is to try and do what we do and that there's an actual written lease between the two, um, you know, between the two parties and says, okay, you are leasing this whatever and you're responsible for this and that. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in the Route 5 property that, um, that did go to tax sale and it had a good ending. Um, I believe that there was something involved there, but again, the lady passed away and daughter was living there, not paying rent, not paying taxes, not doing anything, so. Okay, well, we'll move along to the discussion about the hydro connected road inventory. I see the state and the uh, planning commission has done a really good job for us here. Making all these maps and charts. So this is actually, so to just remind everybody and talking about this in Phil's committee as well, but uh, so this is uh, hydro connected areas. We need to do certain things by 2025. This is at the state statute. Uh, and then we need to follow up on the rest of it done by 2035. Um, 
you know, it sounds like a good amount of time off, 15 years, uh, five years for the, um, for the high priority items. Uh, and again, a hydro connected area is, I'm just gonna be general, there's, there's a, definitely a waterway, 100 yards or within proximity of the, of the road has the ability to run off the road in, into the waterway, which then makes its way to a larger waterway, such as the Connecticut and then down, downstream. <clears throat> Part of what we needed to do before 2000, I think the end of, uh, before the fall of 2020 was inventory of our hydro connected areas. So by mapping, I'd say for almost a year now, Two Rivers has identified what hydro connected areas are in Heartland. And there was approximately 30 to 35 miles of hydro connected area in Heartland. Uh, the second component that we needed to do is, okay, go out and look at and inventory those 30 to 30, 35 miles and determine how well or not well they meet state criteria for what we need to be doing to control water runoff, essentially, again, try and keep this general. So that's what they did, and on your map, so on this piece here, and I'll just hold it up for the, the crowd as well, these are the roads, um, or, or most of the roads that have the hydro-connected areas. Red um, is that it is a high priority, does not meet, um, does not meet state criteria, it's high priority area, and that would need to be done by 2025. The yellow is partially complete, uh, meets, um, and that just means it's not super critical, um, needs to be done by 2035, uh, and we've got a fair amount of mileage that is partial, which is yellow, uh, that needs to be done. Uh, and then on your map that you have, anything green is something that complies, um, and we do have some green on there. Um, so I'm just gonna give you, so the good news is, out of that 30 to 35 miles, basically 50% or 48% complies. So that's, that's pretty good. I was yeah. expecting us to be like a big goose egg. I was like, okay, we're gonna, uh, we were going around last year looking at this and we're kind of taking some Alka-Seltzer because we're like, wow, we're in pretty rough shape. But 50% is compliant. The bad news is at least to Phil and Peter Gregory and to a point Gordon, I've been saying, look, you know, for planning purposes, you should be thinking about doing a mile a year. Um, you know, to get us to where we need to go, uh, the downside to that is a mile is much more than what we've been doing the last two years, but it gets us going in the right direction, at least would get us done by 2025, but wouldn't get us there by 2035. However, 50% of 30 to 35 miles is about 15 miles, so if we do a mile a year, we would actually hit 15 by 2035. Um, now the other 15 miles may or may not come in or out of compliance over the next 15 years as we're working on this 15 miles. Um, but nevertheless, it was, it was kind of a bright spot and what is not a very fun topic of conversation actually. Um, if you look at the map, um, which I think is the most or best place to look, you see some scattering of red. I think that that overall is fairly manageable and can be done by 2025. If you look at the red and yellow combined, it's very obvious that Jennyville Road, Densmore Hill Road, and Reeves Road are a focus um, that they are in need of uh, or will need that cluster in particular uh, will need attention. Um, Weed Road is on there, Garvin Hill, um, portions of Hartlink um, Hill uh, are in need. Um, but certainly if you were to focus on <coughs> a region of town, um, Jennyville, Densmore, Reeves kind of sticks out. 
If you go to the next <coughs> thing, which is this sheet here, we've got P's and F's and M's and D's and all that good stuff. D is does not meet, F is fully meets, P is partial, and N is basically no, basically an NA. Now all you really need to do is kind of flip this, almost like a animation, and you can see that the most yellow, or the most P's, by far, is under the column Berms and Windrows. Um, so, even though ditching, which is the drainage portion, is the second most yellow, um, we've all been talking about ditching being such a headache, and it will continue to be a headache and a focus. Um, the berms really are a topic of conversation. That can be as little as what remains behind from the greater um, to, in the case of Densmore, Jennyville, and Reeves, it's more like 40 years worth of road work and erosion and, and driving. Um, if you are on Jennyville driving towards Reeves, um, on the right you'll see the ledge, on the left there's no mistaking the berm. Um, and over the berm is a downward slope towards basically fields. Yeah. Um, and More the more ideal thing would be to poke through the berm so that the water can drain down the slope and in fields. Now there's some driveways and other things in there, but the concept would be that you would need to, you know, you know, in an ideal world, excavate through the berm and, and get back to a shoulder, mm -hmm. reseed the shoulder, grass comes up, uh, and the road is at the same height as the shoulder, or even above the shoulder, and kind of goes down. Um, again, it's not appropriate, you can't do that in every place, but, you know, the idea is to poke through and, and um, essentially get the water off the road is what they're looking to do. And not only that, but gear it towards fields or someplace that the water can essentially wash through and be absorbed by the grass instead of find its way to the rivers and streams and all that good stuff. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Do you think they want the berms removed, or do you think that it's adequate to, as you said, poke through it? Um, I think it is going to depend on, um, you know, the location in which you, what's possible and what's next to impossible, I think, at the end of the day. You know, I think we've talked about that common sense element, just like the ditching, you know, there is a point where a ditch just isn't gonna work there. Uh, there may very well be instances where removal of berm just isn't gonna work, but again, you, you know, let's just take the turnouts or what Hartland calls a snout. Um, you know, if you can poke that through, you know, at the very least. Um, but again, I think that, um, what they're looking to do is get the shoulder or the road back to, you know, a height where it can drain off into something. Um, you know, whether it be the ditch or off the side of the road and to, you know, to cross from your driveway, Gordon is a prime example, some berms, you know, and over the bank, you, you know, you have a bank that Yeah, those are, can the, go those down. are the small berms, but yeah. Those, those. Oh, well, there's still places are a good foot and a half. Well, yeah, well, some of them are. Foot to a foot. Some yeah. of them are, but a lot of them are. And they've been pretty, well, there's been grading, has been doing pretty well there, especially the last time. But some of the berms are, uh, can hold a uh, lot of yards of fill. I mean, if they're, if they're a foot and a half uh, high yeah. and three feet. This way or more? Yeah. That's a lot of material. And I don't know whether we need some materials, what we could do with all that, but maybe quite a job to clean it up. We, there's people in town that like some, there's people yeah. in town we, oh, yeah. uh, we shouldn't give it to, but... Uh, we could give it, give it some other way, I know. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's a detail we'd have to kind of sort through. Um, the next step in this, so this is the inventory. This is what you all need to know and absorb and, and understand. 
and as far as us going forward um, and kind of the task that we have in front of us to, you know, follow a state statute, essentially. Um, there is a second part of this, so there will be, as part of this inventory, a report to the state where Rita and Bill will go to, you know, the eight to maybe 10 places, and obviously the red would be the first to visit, and then we'll look at, Bill and Rita will look at those particular areas and kind of determine what can and can't be done and some sort of a plan forward in there, and then they'll document that and um, present, they'll take some pictures and some descriptions of what is there, what needs to be done. They'll take that along with this information and they'll submit it to the state of Vermont. That's part of it. We've got, you know, I think that Rita's got a lot on her plate and she'll need to finish that up certainly within a year, but um, you know, we've got a year to finish that process. Uh, Dave, there's, um, on the right-hand column, uh, there's details, history, on that. Uh, um, and are those um, links in the spreadsheet to another spreadsheet, or? Um, those, uh, I've been sent the electronic file. I haven't clicked on any of that, so I don't know where it brings you. No. Um, but it's, you know, there, I, I do have a, a spreadsheet. I don't know what is, lies beneath. So yeah, just didn't know if there was more information or tied back to the map or the segment number or something. Uh, the segment ID is over on the far left, although it's pretty, it's out of sequence. So, you know, they've got a, a segment of Garvin Hill. So we'd have to kind of go back and ask Rita, you know, hey, you know, where exactly is segment 101, 321, but um, it is on the map. So if you go to um, the map and you look at Garvin Hill, you'd be looking for a little red stripe. Um, and you can, right. it becomes fairly apparent. I think it's the one probably midway of the one That's right, my ball's house, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? I think it's just, yeah, because they have a pond. It shows the pond. Is it still falls? No, no, it's got segments. That's curious of why that, why that particular spot. I went up through that last week. It's pretty narrow. You know, oh yeah, the road. Deep. You know, the water is cracked. Yeah. Well, there's only, <laughs> I, I think. it's 14 feet wide. I think the right of way is only 25 feet. So it's not a lot to work with there. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these, in order to truly understand, you need to kind of have to get out of them. Yeah, you look at it. That's um, sure. In this case, they're saying that uh, just as the turnout, so it could be that there's not as narrow, there's not a place for the water to escape. Um, so whatever's going on as far as turnouts there, that may be something that's easily rectifiable. Um, but again, it may be something that um, you have to poke a hole through the berm or something to you know, that effect. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, think I thought today, uh, but I guess ran out of time, of pulling out the uh, original road survey that Two Rivers did for us and tried to see the correlation of that red and yellow to, to this hmm. one. And because um, that also had that sense of a road that was more um, used by the general public and, and um, you know, had more importance from the in a conduit perspective. Um, it'd be interesting to sort of see if the reds correspond and or, or yet we have more red. <laughs> so the only difference here is, you know, looking at this and looking at the road surface one, um, you know, I, Garmin is, you know, does get used, but I wouldn't put it up there as, you know, one of the top priority roads. Mm -hmm. You know, and yet, you know, here's the conflict of, 
the conflict is that, you know, the state of Vermont's like, you know, okay, you know, Garvin Hill, you need to address by 2025. Yeah. So, you know, we may very well be doing work out there in Garvin Hill, um, you know, yeah, before, before we, you know, if we were looking at the other map before we would have been out there doing certain things. Okay. Um, but <laughs> those are management decisions that need to be made as far as, you know, how we attack, you know, how we attack that. I would, I would guess that they don't care how many cars go by. They're worried about the water when it rains. Um, that is... <laughs> well, that's what the state is worried about. <laughs> that is a, uh, that is the priority of this one. So, yeah, yeah. you know, whereas we make management decisions based right. upon the use of the road, here they're saying, you know, we want to keep this... Out of the river, so I it think is a I, bit of a the fact that you written some you wrote that there turnout right yep that D I know what that that is because that that road road is in a terrific groove there's no way the water can ever get out until you come to that turnout and then it all goes out that's that's probably the deal <laughs> well we have to visit these red spots I think. Thankfully, there aren't many of them. Will we try to make the right of way bigger in spots that the right of way is smaller? Ask the landowner for more room? Or? So I think, again, it's going to depend on you know, the situation. I think in most cases, Know, push comes to shove. I don't know if the road necessarily needs to be wide. I think they're looking for, you know, they're looking for the water management in this case. You know, so, you know, by removing the firms may visually make it look wider because, you know, now you're not enclosed and you got a, you know, you got a lower shoulder or whatever. Um, there may be instances where, you know, you may choose to if you wanted to, but um, I think in this case, um, I think the, the, the purpose is, again, think about the ditching, for instance. We did Webster, we didn't necessarily widen the road, but we did do a fair amount of that ditching along the side. Um, again, all for water management purposes, and, you know, you know, we, in that case, we had to speak to a few, you know, landowners about, we were really going to go and where it was going to kind of, you know, how far out it was going to go. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think we really utilized a whole lot more right away than what existed to begin with. Um, so I think that this may be a similar case. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that the committee probably wrestle with is how to deal with narrow roads without I mean if it if it was an extreme case we, we could uh, I think the town has the the ability to widen the right of way if it's necessary. I think it has to be pretty necessary. But I mean either buy it, buy some land or take it Mm -hmm. Take it and then pay for it. It was not particularly necessary. Um, or it might just be a, a reasonable agreement with the landowner. Yeah, and this, the new state standards talk a lot about um, you know diverting the water before it goes into the stream. And one of the one of the strategies is to divert it into a wooded or a field area. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, I'd hate to divert it into a hay field if it was going to sort of like... Well, if it, if it went off in multiple places because there, there, there was no burn, yeah. nobody would even see it. Yeah. Because it would yeah. be a small yeah. amount of exactly. water. That, yeah. the, the problem is concentrating, I think, because we have so many places where the, the water runs a long distance down the road and then finally gets a chance to get out. Right. And it gets to be a lot of water all in one place. It's so moving very rapidly and carrying a lot of material. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Did you say that two deadlines of 2025 and 35? Correct. And the first deadline is 
Getty missed somebody to the state in, that's 2020, right? Or, or is it, that's coming right up. <laughs> Actually, it's December 30, Actually, it's December 31st, 2020. So it's a year from, it's a year from. And what, from what has to happen? Uh, we need to submit the inventory along with um, some plans as to how we're gonna address the critical areas. We're not going to wait to get started. That's what you said. Try to do a mile. Uh, we've already started, so we did yeah. Webster Road. Um, yeah. We'll do segments of Mace Hill is um, on deck here, um, and you know, legitimately, <coughs> should be thinking, you know, between the two of those, you know. Maybe a mile, you know. I mean, they were both pretty good stretches, but I still don't think you get to a mile. I mean, so it was a fair amount of work um, on Webster, and it'll be a fair amount of work on on Mace. Um, you know, once it gets going, it gets going. But um, you know, I, I think the message here is is that you know a mile is more than what we were accustomed moving at. So we need to just kind of think properly. Right now, the state is paying 80% of this, um, or 80% of the project. Uh, there is a second grant we're really not <coughs> taking advantage of, but at the end of the day, we're having a difficult time keeping up with what we're doing, so it's almost difficult to even take advantage of it. Uh, but for the moment, this is why I preach to you guys and Peter Gregory and to our lovely you know, legislators is that a couple of years from now, don't forget this lovely statute that she passed. Yeah, um, yeah. which is what we heard this spring when um, Allison stood in front of the room and sort of said the funding, we're thinking of cutting the funding, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the, you know, we talked a little bit about the uh, the gasoline tax last budget season, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, uh, the taxes are bringing in you know, what it used to, and obviously highway expenses are increasing, and then they pass this, and they are funding it through, you know, the towns, but obviously there's still an imbalance there, so I, you know, we're all expecting it to kind of fizzle out at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hoping their attention span does too, but um, at the end of the day, this is uh, this is you know with the, with the exception of some questions and and you know how to maintain it long term. The underlying concept is good for these roads, so it's something that for the most part has been other than maybe some <coughs> stone line ditching. But I think that even goes back into some of the language of the state standards back in the early or the late nineties. So none of this is really, you know, earth shattering and new. It's just for the first time they're saying this is something you've got to do. Um, whereas before it was kind of a choice. Right. Uh, now they're like, okay, you got to do it. And, and I think we've heard when we looked at Webster and talk about Mace and what you did on that event that um, there's no exact recipe for the road. It's each road has <coughs> many to no culverts that you're working on. It's just ditching. Sometimes there are culverts. Um, so it's hard to sort of get a per segment cost, a general cost when there are culverts or when they're, you know, the size stone that's needed versus, you know, grass needed. Ditch. So we're going to have fun with the roads committee. I look forward to the challenge, I think. Well, there's some potential for the town saving some money by doing things correctly. It, <coughs> echo that, it costs us a lot to go back out and, you know, resurface. We've done Jankville Road many times before, and we just did it this spring, so it costs money to go back and keep doing this stuff.
pleased that Two Rivers turned this around when they said they would. <coughs> so, yeah, so I think we have all the materials, or we're getting all the materials we need to really start making, doing some planning. Yeah, is, is good. Yeah. No, no issues to read Expenses and we're, we're right on target. I, I paid a few expenses that that will show over that because they're just the yearly dues. They'll catch up as it goes. But on the budget as a whole, um, we're at eight percent, so we're right on target for the for the month of July. Um, MVP we got a rate increase of ten point one percent. We need to keep in mind for our next budget process. Blue uh, Cross Blue Shirt, I think it got a thirteen or fourteen percent increase. But MVP got a ten percent increase. So. We'll have to keep track of that for the next budget process. Um, uh, the highway department came in at about 6%. They were a touch under for the month. Um, so that was, a good, that was a good sign to see that. So we are, we're pretty much right on track for, for the first month coming into the year. Even with the uh, buildings and ground guy, which we had built into the budget, we're still, we're, uh, the highways are touching under the budget. The only one that's over is the rec department because they spend all their expenses in the summer. So that does catch up by the end of the, end of the uh, fiscal year. Martin, on the, um, on the general fund on page six, Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know why we had game in hall repairs and maintenance and then another under capital improvements we have game in hall with that's the deposit to fix the roof okay which they finished today and the f under the repairs and maintenance what is that 45 is that just a general budget for 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 the uh, Damon Hall? Yeah. The 7,500? Uh, you're, you're saying the 75 is the roof? Yes. But just above that, um, under the category of Damon Hall, do you have repairs, maintenance? Oh, that's, um, that's the uh, paper towels and glass cleaner and uh, okay. um, smaller stuff that needs to be done, fixed around Damon Hall throughout the year. Okay. Like if a ballast breaks and the lights or something like that. Okay. So the vault roof is all brand new now? All brand new. They, they wrapped it up today. That's good. Should get quite a. <laughs> no more coming. <laughs>
Martin, under the, um, the winter general maintenance on page three of three, we have sand for $40,000. Yes. And last year we talked about uh, sand versus manufactured sand. Correct. Uh, I, I don't know if that's really a road crew question. You know, what's, what, was there a decision made of what material are we going to use for this upcoming season? I think they're going to try some manufacturing, I think. They're going to mix some in, but not, not okay. go completely 100%. Right. They're going to mix some and They're going to start trucking this. Uh, Bill said they're going to start trucking the sand in the next couple of weeks. Start getting this. Yeah. And that's ready for the okay. next season. Are they going to try to mix that at the pile? I don't know if they're going to mix it at the pile or at the, probably at the, um, I would think at the yard they would mix that. I think they're going to mix it at the, uh, at the Santa. Oh, at Santa. Oh, okay. And I'm afraid to ask, but do we really, do we have an animal control officer right now? We do. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, Kate Rowell. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. She's got five boys. They like the motorcycle race. <laughs> I will do roundup when needed. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Pat, any questions? just going to suggest that you might want to make that pile as big as you can because next year you're going to be driving around a detour. 10 mile detour. Uh, well, what a good point, Matt. Maybe there's a business to be started with a helicopter lift. <laughs> so if you had a couple extra loads, you'd save 20 miles, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's twice as much. <laughs> Well, it'll be easier to get the uh, manufactured sand. It'll be relatively less yeah. expensive. Uh, same distance. I know, but uh, relatively, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a better deal. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I think we should nominate Mary. <laughs> <She's not here. laughs> Teach her to go on vacation. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but that would be a bit much. Would that be you, Dave? It can be. I've never actually have gone to the special. They used to do it like during lunch. It used to be a little bit easier now they've got like a whole separate day. They do the, conduct the actual business, so I gotta admit, I haven't gone to the actual. It's not. Um, you know, it sounds like it's a whole mini convention with vendors there and um, other things in the morning. I mean, it, it, what they do is um, the important part of this is VLCT will take kind of a stand on. Um, certain broad issues, and you know they look to have that ratified, mm -hmm. and you know whoever the delegate is, um, will essentially cast a vote as to whether or not agrees or disagrees with kind of what's being proposed. Mm -hmm. um, you know it can be if anybody goes to it, one of the five of you can be it. Um, I have seen how many others delegated. I just haven't been excited enough by any of the proposals to to do the extra afternoon. Um, and it's generally not, you know, sometimes it's up in Winduski or something, and, you know, I'm not really feeling... In Killington. Is it Killington? Oh, in Killington. Still uh, Killington's the last of an hour. Could we put uh, forward a proposal uh, 
as an action item for, for them to work on to make sure that the grant funding for the roads work, work is funded. Could we do that sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm groping for the right words here. Um, so it appears here you have to kind of put something in writing to essentially the legislative uh, committee. So there's different committees right. uh, involved with VLCP and it comes out of the legislative committee, goes to the actual full board of directors, mm -hmm. and then is proposed to be ratified too. So whatever proposals they've got right now or, or have already been brewed up by the legislative committee. Um, so you'd have to submit something to the legislative legislative committee for them to consider. Um, and then they put it out there. It says here, suggested policy amendments may also be presented by full members in writing prior to the meeting or on the floor of the meeting. Yeah. I mean, it's really setting the stage for what the LTC works on for the following year, what the town's theme is important for them to. Yeah, it's kind of some big general, over, you know, it's some, yeah. It's some, yeah, yeah, essentially. I mean, they have essentially two lobbyists that um, Karen Horn and another one, I can't remember her name, um, that spent a lot of time in the capital representing municipalities and also in turn keeping municipalities up to date on what's come out of the legislature. legislature. Sometimes they'll just take a position, you know, as stuff is brewing. But again, I think that's formulated within kind of the, the board structure of the LCP as, as it kind of goes along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm familiar with large organizations also doing it from the floor as well and then getting the delegates to vote yes or no. You can be a delegate. No, I, I yield. <laughs> Who knows, maybe you can bring your skis in October the what? October 2nd, I, I would hesitate. They may actually be there. It's never that great. It's like the top hundred yards. It's raining on the way up and then you can the snow. Well, I can loan you my bicycle and you can ride the mountain bike trail. So, so do we need to nominate Dave? Um, or, or is he not going to talk to me? I mean, you can even give me a little something to pitch for the floor. Um, or I can put something out there if they if they're coming close to that discussion. I can wave my hand and say, hey. Mm -hmm. I do plan on going to at least one of the floor. It's usually, again, I think this is usually the first afternoon and then they have like a full day and then another like half really. day. I usually go to the full day in between. Yeah. Um, it's kind of where I spend my time, but you know, I can go for a half day. Have you ever sent anybody before? Send anyone to this? Uh, no, but I can remember. Yeah. Nobody ever wants to go. The spell wants to go. I don't know. I'm thinking, Dave. I, I should be here at the beginning of October, but I'm you not know, sure. My, back from my want day. to go part is not really high on it. I think higher I used to like to go. They usually have. Uh, after this, in the next two, the following two days, they usually have a good series of seminars. Right. Usually go and, um, you know, there's usually something for myself, you know, the listeners usually have something, so Doug or somebody goes, and, and there's usually a little bit of something for everyone. Um, not sure if Clyde goes, but uh, it's usually some pretty good stuff. Oh, well, that's not the name of day. Make a motion to. Uh, how many days is our step saying it? Um, do we need to do that? I will make a motion that Dave Orbison be the voting delegate from Heartland to the annual business meeting of the LCT. Second. So please go to that. Okay. So, so, so. 
if you choose to go. <laughs> I may go. So we need to send this in at some point. about your notes. Martin mentioned, or I mentioned earlier, we're under 130,000 in delinquents taxes, and we're going to come down to um, probably less than 120, um, which is good news for this year. It kind of ebbs and flows each year, but um, last year I believe we ended the year with about 230 in delinquent taxes. So anything beyond the 230, so as we get towards, let's just stick with 130 for a moment. That's a hundred thousand dollar gain. So in municipal accounting, essentially that $100,000 gain um, is revenue for this year. So um, in those years that we didn't collect it, it became a deferred revenue. Um, now that we are into this particular year, it becomes revenue uh, as we go along here. So it's kind of like when Mary and I kind of got this discussion back and forth as to how it affects the budget. Um, delinquencies in one year is lost revenue in that year, but uh, when you do get around to collecting it, it is revenue in this particular year. Because it's revenue in this particular year, uh, and we essentially weren't expecting it, um, or needed to work for it, that will help reduce the deficit as we go along here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good news. Uh, BCA will be starting, I think it starts this week, the right. 22nd. Yeah, you guys Thursday have night, yeah. Organizational meeting of some sort to set up the schedule. Um, I think last time I knew we had 15 uh, BCA, so that will get going in earnest here. Um, highway department. Uh, let me just uh, spend a little bit of time here. Um, the grants and aid reimbursement request for Webster Road has been submitted. Uh, working with um, Rita, we did submit, um, we did take both invoices from D&D Excavating, uh, which made up that project. Uh, the two efforts combined came to 18,200. The first effort was about 6,500. 
The second effort was about 9,800. Um, that's excluding stone and, and culverts. However, it uh, is a reimbursable amount. If they take that all, um, we'll get back about 14,500. Remember, it's about an 80-20 split, 80% from the state, 20% on us. Um, so that would be good if they take that all and we get the full reimbursement of 14,500. Um, we have been, uh, as we go along here, uh, again, we're still without BJ, although we expect him back next Monday, I believe it's the 26th. Uh, and we are still without the um, tractor, although we are expecting that back soon. In the meantime, we have been laying down three quarter inch hard pack on selected roads. Um, we've dropped about $25,000 worth of material. Uh, was pretty significant. Uh, however, we did not want to use more than half. Remember, we budgeted about 75,000. Uh, we really would like to, you know, not use more than say 30, 35. We'd like to go into next spring with at least half our budgeted allotment um, to drop in the springtime, which is where we'd ultimately like to get um, is we're dropping most of our material in the springtime and then um, you know, as it's as we're trying to get the roads to kind of dry up, mix in with the roads, uh, and then you know after the initial grading, maybe do another grading later in the summer. But the uh, material is already there, um, rather than dropping it. You know, say August last year was August September. Um, again, we've done um, five or six significant roads: um, Rice Road, Hartman Hill, uh, Brothers come to mind. Um, and we've also uh, have swapped out about 11 culverts, um, and we've got, I don't know, maybe about another four or five to go, uh, and we've been working on that uh, as well. Uh, we did get back um, some more FEMA money from the July 17th rainstorm. It's not really FEMA money, this particular amount, the 11 grand is from the state of Vermont. Um, for storm reimbursement, we get 75% from the state, uh, from FEMA, and the remaining 25% is made up from the state and the town. Uh, so that 11 grand uh, is from the state, uh, and 25 months later is now becoming into uh, the revenues again. Um, you know, essentially deferred revenue on that. Uh, we took out two trees on Mace Hill Road. Uh, if you recall, the gentleman, I can't remember his name, came in and uh, was talking about Mace Hill Road. We talked about um, looking to cut those trees, or at least the two really dead ones there. Uh, we took those out. We are looking to, um, working with the cemetery committee, we've got two more to come out on Clay Hill Cemetery. Um, and uh, we have met with FEMA. Uh, I actually meet with FEMA again tomorrow morning to talk about the Mace Hill culvert. Um, I guess I just would like to emphasize that those were storm damage culverts uh, and we, both the Mace Hill and the Jennyville, uh, is really a matter of determining what the funding source is going to be on that, whether it's from FEMA directly as far as a storm cleanup, or it's from FEMA for a mitigation, um, which would the Jenny, what the Jenny, Jennyville culvert would be. Uh, or it's going to be a state emergency management mitigation. Um, either way, we feel pretty strongly somewhere in the category of mitigation falls that Jenny Bill culvert. Um, again, uh, I'll come back to the discussion. Jenny Bill has washed out a couple times, and the culvert has been to some degree a culprit in that. Um, buildings and grounds, here's kind of a big one. Um, so after the last meeting, um, Bill, uh, myself, and Nancy Tosinski um, met with the oven committee. Uh, in that discussion, we kind of put out our concerns. Um, the explanation or description of how this was gonna work from this committee and from the farmer's market so obviously it would be on town land uh, where they have expressed a desire to locate it in the past, 2015, I think the last time it came to the board. Um, that is where they're proposing again. Uh, according to this group, they will do the booking for this. They will 
um, have trained volunteers to help somebody that is a first time user and show them how to use it and care for it. It will be carry in and carry out. Um, and um, you know, so some broad characteristics. Um, essentially, they want to um, reduce the burden on the town. Uh, that was my concern, obviously, last time. I came to the board looking for some guidance on this. Uh, we also put out to them, you know, just the idea of a movable oven, you know, something they can park in the barn when it's not being used. So if they're using it Friday night, it goes away and nobody sees it, touches it, flames on it until it comes back out. Mm -hmm. They uh, cost was a concern, uh, as was movability, um, you know, cost of movement. Um, it's fairly kind of a, just the, the makeup of the, the structure doesn't allow it to be moved a lot. Um, so that, in their eyes, wasn't an option. Um, that's kind of what we put forth first. Um, they came back and said, we want to do this, but we'll kind of take care of it. <laughs> Uh, and that is, you know, some of the details that they laid out. At the end of the day, seemed kind of appeased myself, Bill and Nancy. Um, obviously, in the discussion, uh, it was communicated to them that they needed to kind of hone these ideas, sharpen their thought, and come to the select board. Um, you know, put their ideas in an outline form so I can put it in the packet for you folks, and then they can come to the select board and, and discuss that. Um, I think that really, in my mind at this point, um, I did speak to the insurance VLCT today. Uh, I think that they're going to need to do a site visit weigh in on this. Um, so obviously they could have um, some thoughts of their own as to the do's and don'ts on this. Um, on that note, uh, <laughs> I got hit with all kinds of good stuff. Um, Lucia Jackson came in to see me. Um, she uh, expressed this desire. Um, I told her that I would sit on a committee with her um, to discuss um, the idea of a community um, um, shelter, emergency shelter. Uh, in the beginning of her conversation, she had talked about Dana Hall being used for an emergency shelter. Um, I expressed my skepticism towards that idea for several reasons. Um, one, we don't have a generator here, so if we were to lose power, you know, the building then becomes essentially not usable. Um, she kind of threw out the idea that church is buying a generator. Um, I kind of questioned, she kind of came back to this being um, handicapped accessible. Um, I almost thought that if they were to buy a generator, maybe they could make the churches accessible and they can still have this at the churches. Um, I'm a little skeptical about the idea, again, on volunteers carrying through um, and a couple years down the road, people being used to this being a shelter and the town is responsible for it. Um, the other drawback in my mind is that there's only really one bathroom per man or woman. Um, this is our workspace. We have no meeting space except for here. Um, it has been used um, a tremendous amount for, for meetings. Um, just this summer, again, we'd only do a rephrasal in a couple of years, but um, you know, again, this was kind of booked um, through July and will again be in the August and in the September. So um, it is our place of business. Um, there is only one bathroom per se. Um, that air conditioner was put here for the grievance period. It actually belongs to the Listers. So there's really no air conditioning down here or even worse upstairs it gets really hot. So I think that, um, you know, I think that a lot of people say, okay, this would be a logical choice, but um, there's a lot of reasons why it wouldn't be. And I think that um, my advice would be to flush out, you know, we got more apartment just sitting there. Um, you know, obviously we need kitchen facilities, but, no offices or anything over there. Um, you know, there's other places that certainly I think could be considered before um, you know, we make this the place. Dave, Sarah, Sarah. I have a question. Um, 
question about a process on a topic like this. The two work groups got formed out of breakfast last December, and one of them is this municipal infrastructure work group, which is um, pretty much wrapping up this first list of assignments, and we'll be bringing some um, information forward to the community very shortly. One of the um, smaller topics that that group worked with was around the registration of folks into the um, um, the statewide E911 CARES system. That is to say, people who might need extra help in the community uh, in the certain in the event of an emergency of some sort. So I'm wondering if when a group like the church, you know, represented by Lucia, comes forward with another possible strategy in relation to a community concern, if perhaps her question can be referred also to that work group, and she could be invited to come there and talk about what she's working on uh, as a way to integrate all of these conversations. Done. <laughs> I don't know if it was taken, but it was, it was conveyed to her that these groups are meeting. Um, a couple members of her church are actually part of that group. Um, I mentioned it upside down, sideways, and every which way that this group is discussing these things, and um, she'd be more than willing to, you know, sit in on that. Um, I did tell her, I'd email her when, you know, which I think is gonna be in September, um, whether she takes that up or lets one of them. I think it's September 4th, and we could ask that um, Alice Stewart give her time on the agenda and ask if she'd like that time on the agenda. Right. And whether, and you know, just to clarify, the September 4th, for those who aren't aware, is a, a joint meeting of the two groups right. to come together to talk about what's been going on for the last eight months or a year and to focus put focus on what's going, you know, what they're, will deliver to the select board as well as kind of moving forward. So, yeah. 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 I could pass on, if she's not there, I'll pass. You could ask me if anything has come up recently, I'll pass it on. Thank I'll you, make sir. a note. Um, last thing, uh, Robbie and Greg stopped in, gave me kind of an update on the Conservation Committee. A uh, couple things that they're working on. Um, they are looking at Eshkola Bog and um, working with the state to get that classified as a class one wetland. Uh, personally, I'm a little bit at a loss as to why is it, but apparently it's not on the wetland maps. Um, I'm not entirely sure of it other than getting it recognized as a wetland since it is protected property. Um, you know, it does have a conservation easement on it. There's some funkiness about a bog really isn't, since it's a, I don't understand it. There's some scientific thing that's a different kind of wetland than, than a wetland. Yeah, that's, called, that's called a fin. Ah, okay. Uh, then we'd like to come back in the fall and talk a little bit more about the Emerald Land Horror. And the um, last thing is um, they are looking and talking about the legal trails and kind of marking them you know, with some signage you know, for walking and biking and horseback riding as such. And Rob has talked, I think he's standing on those um, blood trail discussions um, and um, is thinking about a legal trail policy. Um, he's looked at Norwich has one, but a whole lot of other towns have one. Um, he's kind of looked at, he said Hartford has uh, a trail policy for trails in their town forest, but nothing really other than that. Um, however, he did note that a lot of towns around us don't have any real significant number of legal trails, and we've got like six of them. So we found that to be kind of interesting. Um, so that's kind of it. Gordon, can I uh, just give a quick update on the Energy Committee? Um, Dave, I think you're aware of this, but um, I, I reported after the June meeting that they were making really good progress on the Enhanced Energy Plan, um, which they're charged to, to, to do for the town plan. Um, 
I missed the July meeting, and this past meeting, uh, things were really in disarray, and they were going in 40 different directions, and um, the representative from um, Two Rivers uh, did send a, a follow-up email and said, here's the homework that has to be done, and if, if we don't get on track, we're gonna miss their funding, the Two Rivers funding's gonna run out, so I, I think hopefully <coughs> meeting in September, we'll get back to being as productive as the early ones were. So. Um, we missed you on the budget thing. Chuck, do you want, is there something you want to s well, I want to bring forth a question that several elders have expressed through Aging and Heartland, and that is a question of why if the land list of the town has increased by over $20 million, why the tax rate has also increased. Not doing the math. Not doing the math. <laughs> Martin? So the, the town budget on the highway side went up this year. Where it, didn't, it hasn't really stayed pretty stagnant the last three years, three, four years. That was part of the, the reason why they, but the tax goes on a whole didn't go up too, too much. It went up like a nickel went through the town, right? Yeah. Yeah, they didn't go up that much. But the school part of it, that went up, that went from, I think last year the, the homestead was 1.515 and this year's 1.587 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the non-residential went down. Right. Because we're spending so much money in this town on the school, so that's why the homestead went up. That Didn't our CLA go up also? It was not affected. Yes. Yeah, that went up also just a little bit, but not too much. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I thought we were really behind on the CLA, which is why we were appraised. I don't believe that. The CLA was over one last year, and it's still over one this year. But the school, the school budget was a big driver this year, because they had to put revenues to reduce it, otherwise it would have been a true goal town. Well, Martin, is the CLA historic? I mean, it isn't, it isn't up to date with our reappraisal, is it? It should be after this year. I know, but is it currently the CLA that we're working with now? No, that's from last year. That's what I thought. Yeah. So that may change next year. Oh, it may change next year. But again, the school budget, we were right at the peak. I mean, they had to put 18 or 20,000 worth of revenue to reduce it so we didn't crest over the, the um, Gold Town portion. So I think they're going to have the same problem again this year. So let me just clarify real quick. So now last year we had a 1.01 CLA. They did recalculate the CLA after the reappraisal. Oh, they did. Which they utilized for this one. They came okay. up with a CLA of actually 1.07, which actually means is why the tax rate did not go up as much as it should have for the school. Um, however, it's kind of a funky time, so we'll have a better idea of the CLA come January when they recalculate it again. Um, they recalculated the CLA again going into um, the new year, and that's actually what they do the final tax bill with, is that CLA. So um, we'll have a better idea as to what it is um, for a CLA, but for the purposes of this tax rate, they use the CLA of 1.07. Well, then they, that, that's unusual, isn't it, because if we have the reappraisal? It would mean that the appraisal, according to the state, is appraising high. Yeah, but, but what I mean is the fact that them, of them doing it is unusual. Doing the CLA? Yeah. They... I mean, in mid-year. So they always do a CLA. So when you submit to them your grand list, we didn't submit it until August. Um, but if we didn't have the review, it would have been submitted on June 4th. So every year when you submit it on June 4th, they recalculate the CLA, they calculate a CLA for um, tax rate purposes. 
okay? And that's what you set your tax rate on. Double up the state. When you send, you send a final, it's called a 411 form. You send that at the end of, so after you, uh, the last you can do with errors and emissions is at the end of December. So then you send a final, so after all the errors and emissions that are in place, you send a final 411 for the state, of which they recalculate the CLA. And then they calculate the final bill to the school based upon the January submission. So sometimes we get a little bit of money back that we weren't expecting because of whatever, and sometimes it goes the other way. So we calculate it twice. Shouldn't really deviate a whole lot, but we're expecting that it may deviate some between because of the reappraisal between the one that they just did and, and the one in January. Marvin's what determines the ratio between the non res and the res rate? How does that who establishes that state? state. Yeah, we have no control over that. The department of taxes. No, I believe the Department of Education. Department of Education. And did the Treasury Department, right? Yeah. Oh, did you turn on one? That's the rate. A non-res rate. It becomes, it goes through the Department of Taxes, but the, the, the school tax rate is ultimately decided by, in this case, it was decided by the, the Department of Education, and it came back through the Department of Taxes to us. I mean, they accumulate most of the, a lot of their information to basically the person's tax form. Right. So, um, other various things, I mean, prebate kind of plays a role in this, um, and other things, so it gets convoluted in there. time where we are with the roads committee because I think we, we haven't met for a while and I mm. did say that we had the Rita Cito and um, Todd Eaton from Vermont Local Roads give us a presentation to, um, and there's a meeting tomorrow and then the following <coughs> week there's a meeting as well. Getting a price on patching Hatlink which you wrote up a little bit before winter. I um, shoveled on the county road for the first time yesterday and in the daylight. Um, and I see why we're talking about repaving some of those sections. It's it's pretty bad. From Rice Road going down to Brownsville Road. Um, but I think the Quichy Road is much worse. So, I might have to Heartland's County Road is better than Windsor's. Oh. If you went all the way. I did. <laughs> and my hands are still sore from when I was on a bicycle. I hit those. I thought I was going to be in Mount Skeppy Hospital when I was reaching some of those turns. <laughs> yeah, I was a surprise because there's a second that's paved and then all of a sudden it's not paved mm -hmm. or not. It's, it's very upset. It's very, very deteriorated. Yeah. Yep. You're all good. Okay. Okay. So we have scheduled next thing here is a brief executive session for a pending legal issue. <coughs> so. So I need to make this motion. Yep. 